Hello students, welcome to biology class. This video is in continuity with the previous video of chapter Movements and Locomotion. Objectives that we are covering in this video are Appendicular Skeleton, Joints and Muscles. Starting with the Appendicular Skeleton. The appendicular skeleton is the portion of the skeleton of vertebrates consisting of the bones that support the appendages. There are 126 bones. The appendicular skeleton includes the skeletal elements within the limbs as well as supporting shoulder girdle, pectoral and pelvic girdle. The word appendicular is the adjective of the noun appendage which itself means a part that is joined to something larger in this image we can see the appendicular skeleton which consists of shoulder girdle upper limbs pelvic girdle and lower limbs appendicular skeleton is divided into six major regions First one, shoulder girdle, consisting of four bones, left and right clavicle and scapula. Arms and forearms, consisting of six bones, left and right humerus, ulna and radius. Hands, which comprises of 54 bones, left and right carpals, metacarpals, proximal phalanges, intermediate phalanges and distal phalanges. Then pelvis or pelvic girdle, left hip bone and right hip bone. Thighs and legs which consist of left and right femur, patella bone, tibia and fibula. Then comes feet and ankle, left and right tarsals metatarsals, proximal phalanges, intermediate phalanges and distal phalanges. Starting with the pectoral girdle. The shoulder girdle or pectoral girdle is the set of bones in the appendicular skeleton which connects to the arm on each side. In human, it consists of the clavicle and scapula. The shoulder girdle is an anatomical mechanism that allows for all upper arm and shoulder movement in humans. The shoulder girdle consists of five muscles that attach to the clavicle and scapula and allow for the motion. In this image, we can see the clavicle and scapula. Clavicle. The clavicle or collarbone is a slender S-shaped bone approximately 6 inches 15 centimeter long bone that serves as a strut between the shoulder blade and the sternum. There are two clavicles, one on the left and one on the right. The clavicle is the only long bone in the body that lies horizontally. It can be divided into three parts, the medial end, the lateral end and the shaft. Next comes scapula, also known as the shoulder bone Shoulder blade, wing bone or blade bone is the bone that connects the humerus, upper arm bone with the clavicle that is the collar bone. Like their connected bones, the scapulae are paired with each scapula on either side of the body being roughly a mirror image of the other. Now next comes the upper limb. The upper limbs include the bones of the arm, humerus, forearm, radius and ulna, wrist and hand. The only bone of the arm is the humerus which articulates with the forearm bones, the radius and ulna at the elbow joint. The ulna is the larger of the two forearm bones. The hand includes eight bones in the wrist. 5 bones that form the palm and 14 bones that form the fingers and thumb. The wrist bones 
are called carpals the bones that form the palm of the hand are called metacarpals and the phalanges are the bones of the fingers in this image we can see the bones of the upper limb humerus then the forearm which comprises radius and ulna and wrist and hand comprises of carpals metacarpals and phalanges in this image also we can see the wrist bones there are total 8 bones in the wrist and then hand bones which comprises of wrist carpals palm bones that are metacarpals and the phalanges which are further divided into 3 that is the proximal distal and intermediate next we are discussing the pelvis girdle the pelvis is the lower part of the trunk of the human body between the abdomen and the thighs sometimes also called the pelvic region of the trunk or the skeleton embedded in it the pelvic girdle is composed of the appendicular hip bones ilium ischium and pubis oriented in a ring and connects the pelvic region of the spine to the lower limbs in this image we can see the pelvic girdle the pelvic girdle is a bowl like structure present in the sacral region of the trunk now it provides articulation to the bones of legs here is difference between the female and the male pelvis the female and the male pelvises differ in several ways due to the child bearing adaptations in the female the female pelvic brim is larger and wider than the males the angle of the pubic arc is greater in the female pelvis over 90 degrees than in the male pelvis less than 90 degrees the male pelvis is deeper and has a narrower pelvic outlet than the females in this image we can see a clear difference between the pelvic brim the females have a wider pelvic brim and there is also the difference in the pubic arc next we are moving on to the topic lower limb the lower limbs include the bones of the thigh leg and foot the femur is the only bone of the thigh it articulates with the two bones of the leg the larger tibia commonly known as the shin and smaller fibula the thigh and the leg bones articulate at the knee joint that is protected and enhanced by the patella bone the bones of the foot include tarsus metatarsus and phalanges in this image we can see the bones of the lower limb here are the foot bones that includes tarsals ankle bones then metatarsals and then phalanges now moving on to the next topic joints of the human body joints hold the skeleton together and support movement joints in the human skeleton can be grouped by function range of motion and by structure according to the range of motion joints can be divided into three types first one is immovable joints immovable joints are the joints allows no movement of the joint that include skull sutures the articulation between the teeth and the mandible and the joint found between the first pair of ribs and the sternum these are the immovable joints of the body next comes joints that allow slight movement or little movement that includes the distal joint between the tibia and the fibula and also the pubic symphysis of the pelvic girdle next type of joint is that allows the full movement or the maximum movement included many bone articulation in the upper and the lower limbs example of these include the elbow shoulder and ankle in this image we can see the types of joints depending upon range of motion next we are discussing type of joints depending upon the structure 
now there are fibrous joint cartilaginous joints and synovial joints starting with fibrous joints between the articulation of fibrous joints is thick connective tissue that is why most fibrous joints are immovable there are three types of fibrous joints first one sutures sutures are non moving joints that connects bone of the skull second one the fibrous articulation between the teeth and the mandible or maxilla a syndesmosis is a joint in which a ligament connects two bones allowing for a little movement the distal joint between the tibia and fibula is an example of the syndesmosis in this image we can see the fibrous joints next come cartilaginous joints now joints that unite bones with cartilage are called cartilaginous joints there are two types of cartilaginous joints the first one is synchondrosis is an immovable cartilaginous joints one example is the joint between the first pair of ribs and the sternum second is symphysis consist of a compressible fibrocartilaginous pad that connects two bones this type of joints allow for some movement the hip bones connected by the pubic symphysis and the vertebrae connected by intervertebral discs are two examples of symphysis in this image we can see the two types of cartilaginous joints now moving on to the synovial joints or the freely movable joints synovial joints are characterized by the presence of an articular capsule between the two joint bones bone surfaces at synovial joints are protected by a coating of articular cartilage synovial joints are often supported and reinforced by surrounding ligaments which limit movement to prevent injury there are six types of synovial joints first one gliding joint move against each other on a single plane major gliding joints included the intervertebral joints and the bones of the wrist and ankles next come hinge joint move on just one axis these joints allow for flexion and extension major hinge joints include the elbow and finger joints next a pivot joint provides rotation at the top of the spine the atlas and the axis form a pivot joint that allows for the rotation of the head in this image we can see the six types of synovial joint gliding joint hinge joint saddle joint condyloid joint ball and socket joint and pivot joint a condyloid joint allows for circular motion flexion and extension the wrist joint between the radius and the carpal bones is an example of a condyloid joint a saddle joint allows for flexion extension and other movements but no rotation in the hand the thumb saddle joint lets the thumb cross over the palm making it opposable the ball and socket joint is a freely moving joint that can rotate on any axis the hip and the shoulder joints are the example of ball and socket joints next we are discussing muscles of the human body the muscles that move the human skeleton vary greatly in the shape and size and extend to every part of our bodies the muscular system contains over 600 skeletal muscles alone which make up about 40% of our mass blood vessels and nerves run to every muscle helping control and regulate each muscle's function in this image we can see 
all the 600 plus skeletal muscles. In the muscular system, there are three types of muscles. Skeletal muscles are connected to the skeleton, either to the bone or to the connective tissue such as ligaments. Muscles are always attached to two or more places. When the muscles contracts, the attachment points are pulled closer together. When it relaxes, the attachment points move apart. This helps in the movement of the bone. Now, this is the first type of muscles, the skeletal muscles which are attached to the bones. Next type of muscles are smooth muscles. Smooth muscle tissue is in the walls of many human body organs and help those organs move to facilitate body functions. The elementary canal includes muscle tissues that contract and relax to move nutrients through the digestion process. The urinary bladder also includes muscle tissues that contract and relaxes to hold and release urine. Heartbeats are the result of the contraction and relaxation of muscle tissues in the heart wall. Smooth muscles in the walls of arteries help move blood through the body. In this image, we can see the smooth muscles that make up the walls of many organs. Smooth muscle tissues are involuntary in action. The next comes the cardiac muscles. The heart wall is composed of three layers. The middle layer, the myocardium, is responsible for the heart's pumping action. Cardiac muscles found only in the myocardium contracts in response to signals from the cardiac conduction system to make the heart beat. Cardiac muscle is made up from cells called cardiocytes. Cardiocytes are branched allowing them to connect with several other cardiocytes forming a network that facilitates coordinating contraction. In this image, we can see the cardiac muscles. The middle layer that is myocardium is formed of cardiac muscles. Cardiac muscles are also involuntary in action. Moving on to the last topic, antagonistic muscles. Muscles transfer force to bones through tendons. Tendons is the tissue that connect muscles to bones. They move our bones and associated body parts by pulling on them. This process is called muscle contraction. However, muscle contraction cannot act to push the bone back into its original position. And because of this, muscle work in antagonistic muscle pairs. One muscle of the pair contracts to move the body part and the other muscle in the pair then contracts to return the body part back to the original position. Muscles that work like this are called antagonistic pairs. In an antagonistic muscle pair, as one muscle contracts, the other muscle relaxes or lengthens. The muscle that is contracting is called agonist and the muscle that is relaxing or lengthening is called antagonist. In this image, we can see the two types of muscles. First one, the bicep muscles and the tricep muscles. When bicep muscles are contracted, the tricep muscles are relaxed. And when the bicep muscles relax, the other tricep muscles are contracted. So, in this way, these muscles work antagonistic to each other. Thank you so much.